Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy, and today I am very excited to have Laura and Sarah with me, and we are going to talk about all things Carnivore 75 Hard. You guys have brought in a bunch of questions, and so we are going to try to get through them and just talk up a little bit about our experiences. So Sarah, Laura, thank you for joining me today and um, doing this Q&A with us. <laughs> Um, you know, we are more than two weeks in and I would just like to get a brief kind of like what's been going on for you guys. Like, what have you seen? What are your benefits? And then even in terms of the community, what have you guys seen that's been going on? So, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Laura, do you want to start? And then maybe Sarah. Sure. Um, I think for me, this has been a really good chance to reset. Once I hit maintenance mode, I kind of got a little lazy with eating times and meal windows and so I have been snacking on carnivore foods too much and so this has really helped me to dial in and refocus on my specific eating window not overeating um, and honestly movement is not something that I have incorporated daily and so that's been really nice is to make that intentional so I've really appreciated the refocus on that um, I think the surprising parts is like the gratitude in the community and I've seen people really reaching out to each other, supporting each other. I think this took off more than any of us would have thought it would, and that's been the exciting part. Um, people are struggling with it, especially if they're coming from a more standard diet and not, or from keto and not already carnivore. But I think that I've seen so many people getting encouraged by others and pushing through that that's been, for me, one of the biggest kind of blessings at all this is I think there's a lot of genuine connections that are being made and yes. that's been really exciting to see. Yeah, I've seen that too. I, I think it's pretty amazing. Um, so what about you, Sarah? Um, I am absolutely loving the energy, the support. It's, it's exactly what I needed. I had gone on vacation in September and just, you know, was kind of eating not really in a specific window. I thought I was fasting, but I wasn't really, fa you know, you think you're 16, eight fasting, you're not really, you know? Um, so it's been good to kind of put that discipline back into my life. Um, for me, I kind of am someone who thrives on discipline um, and having, it's, it's hard to be disciplined, especially with your food. You know, when you have a lot of emotions tied to the way you eat, especially this time of year, you know? Um, so I've really, really loved like the group support, especially, just our first Halloween um, that we went through. I This is the first Halloween I've ever had where I did not eat candy and make myself sick, like that I can ever remember. So I'm feeling super good about that. Um, so I'm really loving all the, just the group energy and the support and then the discipline um, is helping me a lot. That's good. Um, so really quickly, so Laura, with your, um, you know, you said you don't do movement, you didn't do movement every day and then now you are. So. I'm assuming that there are some days that you don't want to do it, but like, how do you get yourself motivated um, to still and, you know, g keep going? I mean, I love a good list. And so having the graphics that you did where I have to check off a uh -huh. box is like, you know, it's, I'm, I'm a be obedient person. And so I'm going to do that. Um, I just, I'm not a big like walk person. And so doing something in the living room, doing some squats, doing, going outside and doing some squats. I have been doing a lot of, um, shorter walks just to get the movement in, but I think that's part of it. It's just knowing I don't want to let myself down or right. I have, my husband's doing this with me as well. So that's okay. helping. So we kind of check in with each other, make sure we're both being accountable. That's awesome. And so what about you, Sarah? You talked about fasting. So has it gotten easier to really do the 16-8 now? Oh, definitely. The first week it was really hard because, you know, you're cooking breakfast for your family and, you know, you've got the bacon out there and you're like, oh, I really would. It's almost like you have to be super mindful because you just want to reach down and grab that little piece yes. of bacon and have a bite. Um, so, and I was definitely a lot more hungry the first probably week and a half. But after I got over that first probably 10 days, that hump there, the fasting is a lot easier now. Now I'm finding myself doing it very easily. Uh, I'm not tempted by snacks and, you know, the food that I'm cooking for my family as much as I was when I first started. So it's, it's definitely getting a lot easier. Yeah, no, I had the same experience. So I get, I'm used to like, if something gets on my finger, I'll just like lick it if I'm, you know, touching or cooking food and I'm like, oh, I can't even do that. Especially if the bacon adds sugar. But 
Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. So I should actually do a video later, but I am the same as you guys. So I'm an obliger and I should define these terms. It's it's similar yeah. to that stainer thing, but I so what that means is like I work really well with external uh, motivation. So mm -hmm. I may not be strong enough to do things for me, but if I know people are relying on me, then I'm so much better at getting it done. And that's the obliger personality. And I think a lot of people in the carnivore space probably are obligers. I'll do a separate video and explaining, but there's basically the personality of an obliger, a rebel, and then um, there's one other, but I, I'm forgetting. Um, oh, and a upholder. And so basically these are how you are motivated and what triggers you to actually get things done. I'll do a separate thing. But so anyways, um, this movement has really forced me to, like, I don't even question that I'll cheat because I feel like there's so much expectations for all of us to complete. And so if I even fall, like that's ridiculous. And so the obliger part of me, it's really motivating to see the community. It's just amazing. Um, so thank you guys, you know, again, being part of the like leader community of this and helping push this to, you know, have everyone see this through because we, I think so many of us in the community are depending on this to really get us through the holidays and to then be stronger for 2020. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on now to the questions that have come in. So one of the questions that have first come in is about weight loss. And um, I don't know if you guys have dealt with any of the hypothyroidism, but that is one of the questions is what, you know, can you talk a little bit about weight loss in um, specifically in terms of hypothyroidism? If any of you guys want to go, Phil. Do you want to give just kind of a, can you give Judy like a super quick, like what is hypothyroidism? And, oh, sure, uh, sure. Just so a lot of times um based on maybe your past eating basically if you've always done dieting or if you've uh, eaten really low carb or really i mean i'm sorry really um you know processed foods or just you know you were like undernourished or malnourished then your thyroid eventually with stress and sugars and all these things your thyroid can then start under functioning because of one it could be just you've overtaxed it and so over time, you could either become hyperthyroid or you could have um, like under functioning thyroid, which is a lot of us, and that's hypothyroidism. And so, in terms of, I think a lot of people want to lose weight, but when you have hypothyroidism, it's very difficult to lose weight because the thyroid is where a lot of your metabolic, so what allows you to lose weight and mm -hmm. to, you know, have a certain metabolic rate in your body that will always be dependent on your thyroid. And so when you have an under functioning thyroid, even if you're eating a lesser amount of calories, you can actually hold on to weight because your thyroid is not able to balance the calories and all of that. And so that's sort of in a nutshell, what hypothyroid is. Um, you could get it in multiple ways, but I mean, the biggest thing is if you over diet and then I think stress and then also having a very sugary, high rich diet and those types of foods that can also cause your thyroid to start under functioning. So that that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. I don't have anything that's been like clinically diagnosed oh, okay. as far as that goes. Um, I, so I didn't know if you were talking in terms of just like a clinical diagnosis too, but I know there was before last year I was like losing weight and I was on a roll and, and had no issues with that. But in the last six months, I definitely noticed a change in my body has been working to heal some things. It's been working to balance out hormones. And so part of that snacking, I steadily have gained some weight. And through that, I think my body's been doing a lot of healing and now being on carnivore 75 hard for the last two weeks, being extremely strict with eating times and portions and what I'm doing, I have not lost one pound. So for some people now to be what 17 days in and to have lost zero weight with being hundred percent strict are saying I'm in a stall. What should I do? Um, but I have seen a lot of positive changes in my body through this time. So it's hard to say that maybe there's some times when your body's just not ready to let go of that weight because you're healing so much. And I think currently that's what I'm doing. I'm sitting about 20 pounds heavier right now than my lowest ever, um, which was several months ago. And so, you know, I don't know if specifically related to the hypothyroidism, but I do think that there are times when maybe if you're doing everything right, your body just might be hanging onto some things to try to heal itself. I, I agree. Um, Laura, yeah. Do you have anything? To I mean, I'm kind of in the same boat as Laura. I mean, I had a hundred pound weight loss 10 years ago. And so the last 10 years for me has just been like, how do I find the right way of eating that is optimal for my body? 
Um, so carnivore for me hasn't been a big weight loss diet. And I had put on a little bit of weight from just the snacking and kind of, you know, eating like the non-carnivore foods on vacation. And um, I've definitely, my body composition has changed in the last, you know, 17 days. Absolutely. Like my stomach's flatter. But I haven't felt like I've just lost tons and tons of weight. Like my clothes, um, they fit a little bit differently, but I don't feel like I'm having a big weight loss. So it's definitely a case of I think my body is just trying to heal some stuff, absolutely, and it's prioritizing that. So um, that that can be challenging, you know, because you feel like you're doing everything you can do to eat the right stuff, and you're staying in the 16-8, and you're not snacking, and you're not seeing, like, those immediate results. Um, but I do have a lot of faith in this way of eating and mentally I feel a lot clearer. Um, you know, emotionally I feel a lot clearer. I don't have like that lingering depression, that kind of doom feeling that I get when I'm eating carbs and, um, little, you know, non, not even carbs, but non carnivore foods like, um, a quest bar, keto treats, those things give me the kind of reaction that, you know, a Snickers bar would. So, I have a lot of relief from that, so for that, I'm grateful. Um, you know, I don't know if it's hypothyroidism hasn't been clinically, um, you know, I guess diagnosed as such, but it de I'm definitely like not have. I'm looking at the Facebook group and people are like, "Oh, I lost 10 pounds. I lost 15 pounds," and I'm like, "Yeah, no, not me." Um, so, <laughs> just a, it's a patience game for sure. Yes. So, I mean, I'll just end this question with this. I think. If you have a lot of weight to lose, then it will be much easier to lose weight and very quickly, especially if you go from a high carb diet or a non keto, non low carb diet, your kidneys will release a lot of the water. And so basically you'll lose a lot of water weight very quickly. Um, I always recommend, you know, eat to satiety, make sure you heal your body. And then once you find a balance, that's when you can start moving levers to lose weight and figure out, you know, mm -hmm. should I fast more? But you need to make sure to lose weight first. I mean, I'm sorry, you need to make sure to heal first and then you can move the levers. Like I too gained weight on carnivore, but I mean, I have my mental health and I have all this energy and I am just a happier person. And so if my body wants to be a little bit heavier than when, I mean, I was malnourished on a vegetarian diet, then so be it. But our bodies will never find the homeostatic point where it's like we're overweight. It's just, I mean, you guys are relatively thin and that's probably why you guys aren't losing a significant amount. But if you guys had a hundred pounds to lose, you guys probably would have noticed that change in the last 17 days, right? So um, I, I think everyone should really just eat to satiety, not, you know, I, I think the fear is that a lot of people, they're all of a sudden, oh my gosh, I'm losing so much weight. And so they're starting to cut calories until like 500, 800, you know, you don't feel hungry. So you're like, cool, I'll like quickly lose weight. But that's when you could be damaging your endocrine system, which is all the stuff that fun uh, manages your hormones. And then that'll directly affect your adrenals and your mm -hmm. thyroid. And that's when you're going to have all these downstream negative effects. And that is why I am so big on do not cut calories because yes, you can, you don't feel hungry, but you will downstream feel the adverse effects of it. Yeah. Um, in terms of thyroid, uh, I do think you could do this diet. I know some people think, well, you need to have a little bit of carbs so that your thyroid can function better. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think try the meat heals and see if, how it works. Mm -hmm. If even after like six months, a year, it's still bad, then maybe think about incorporating carbs. But I don't think you should follow mainstream recommendations when we're not following a mainstream diet. Okay, so moving on, um, there's a question about menstrual cycles. Some people are getting late in their carnivore um, diet adventure. So do you guys wanna talk about, I know Laura, you just kind of mentioned, um, do you guys wanna talk about anything in terms of that? I think just briefly that I think any type of diet change or weight change is gonna cause um, differences in your cycle. I went through a lot of inconsistencies when I was losing a lot of weight. I actually went through several months of not having a, a cycle and that to me signaled that something was off. So I reached out to people around and was working on making some adjustments, working on my sleep, working on some things to balance, playing around with the how much I'm eating. I think I was under eating for a little bit over fasting and that was contributing to it. Um, and I noticed that, you know, I think part of this me healing, I've been able to get my cycle back and have that be um, more standard now. So I think 
that's kind of where my body is now. And I think that it's definitely something worth looking into. But anytime that you have this drastic change in weight or diet, there are going to be inconsistencies. Um, so just be aware of that and try to troubleshoot as you can. I can't give you, tell you exactly what I did to get things back again, because it's going to be different for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been to um, my doctor, gotten some blood work done just to check my hormones, just to make sure I wasn't low on anything. So for me, I was also kind of under eating, over fasting. I did a lot of fasting and my cycle just went away for a couple of months. And so that's what kind of led me to talk with my doctor. I think everyone should have a doctor. I'm lucky that my doctor is uh, also carnivore, Dr. Rimka. So she is very helpful with helping me, you know, get the right testing. And um, I upped my fat. I, you'll see, I do eat some beef suet and bone marrow because um, my progesterone was a little bit low. So I've started to just add that extra fat and I may end up after this, I'm getting some more blood work done this week. I may end up going on some progesterone supplements, um, but I'm also 40. So I'm, you know, that's, this is kind of normal for a 40 year old to start seeing hormones changing and shifting. Um, so, you know, if you're missing your period uh, and you're, you know, at a kind of a stable weight, you don't have tons of weight to lose and you haven't lost a ton of weight. I think sometimes it can be helpful to, you know, work with your doctor a little bit, just make sure that you're hormonally um, not missing something, you know? Sure. I, I think those make a lot of sense. Um, I definitely recommend tweaking the diet first before adding supplements. But I mean, I think it's smart that you're working with your doctor and making sure getting blood work every once in a while to make sure that your hormones are, sta um, are stable. But the only one disclaimer I'd put about getting your blood work is hormones, um, when, especially when you get blood work, it's just a snapshot in time. So if you had a bad week, it could actually affect the results. So, you know, it's better to, and like you're doing that. So you're getting, you know, multiple um, tests, yeah, make sure go like day three, day 19, 20, 21. Like, I feel like I'm getting <laughs> blood work done like five days a month just to kind of, I know that, that's the good thing. Test, and the Dutch test is a lot more expensive. This is yeah. why I'm doing the, what my insurance will pay for sure. uh, at this point. So yeah, you're right. <laughs> Yeah, no, but I mean, you're doing it right. I think that's the best way. If you just get one snapshot and then you're like, oh, I'll just add, you know, this and that supplement. I think, I don't know if that's necessarily the best approach, you know, but it's if you do multiple snapshots and then you're like always low in vitamin D, you can figure out why are you maybe just incorporate foods that have more vitamin D and the other um, coenzymes and minerals, like um, adding more vitamin K2 with vitamin D to get absorbed, then maybe down the road, you know, add the vitamin D, but yeah so anyways um i think you're doing it right i think everything you guys said made sense i don't think i have anything to add to it right now um so let's move on we have another question um it says do you experience runs or constipation while going carnivore and then how did you guys handle that i definitely have um there was that adaptation period i think for me that that lasted a longer time in the beginning um don't have constipation so the loose stools i know that happens for a lot of people and some people that can heal in a couple weeks and for me it took a very long time to be honest um i also think i tend to drink too much water i just naturally drink a lot of liquid and that contributes to it when i cut back to drinking only to thirst and drinking less during my meals i noticed that that is fixes a lot of the issues. I also notice if I eat still, even though I've been doing this for 18 months, if I eat too much at once, um, then I still have those issues. And so from what I've researched, sometimes just too much protein all in one sitting can be um, a cause of that. And especially with too much liquid combined, just drinking too much water. So for instance, you know, we went to Bogota Chow. I eat more than I normally eat. It's not like my normal daily portion. I'm excess eating on protein, drinking a lot of liquid, I still even now could have um, some of those issues, which is, I think, due to less like not treating my body right in that moment. Um, but I think it does, it definitely happens. It's an adaptation period. And for me, it lasted longer, I think, than most people, just because of some of my habits that were not so good. Did you ever take any digestive enzymes for like when you transitioned to carnivore? No, I think I just didn't know anything about that or what to do. So uh, I've never taken anything 
I maybe I should have. I don't know, but I never took anything to help with that. Okay. Okay. And what about you? I was lucky, honestly. I really did not have. Oh wow. Any issues? Um, I guess my body was just like, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard so many people struggle with the digestive issues, but my, um, I came from a high fiber diet. I was eating tons of Brussels sprouts and collard greens and kale and like trying to do the smoothie every day and the nuts and all that stuff. And so I kind of experienced the opposite. So going from a lot of digestive distress to finally like feeling um, like really good. Uh, so I was very lucky in that regard. I haven't, ha I've not had any kind of digestive issues at all and I have no constipation, none of that. Well, well, that's one, I think you're a rarity. Yeah, um, so, so. <laughs> so I, and, um, I'll kind of give a quick summary. So I was vegetarian too. So I went through, like, I think oh. if I would eat too much dairy, I noticed that I would kind of get constipation, but then if I had too mm -hmm. much fat, I would have the loose stools. And then especially if I was eating, you know, high protein, high fat, and then adding bone broth. As much as your bone broth is supposed to do, be gut heal healing, it could, with all of that, it would still give me the runs. Yeah. And so um, I think the biggest thing for me that has helped me and even my clients is the digestive enzyme. So basically you can think of it where your gallbladder is kind of the excess bile where it, it stores all the things that will basically process your fats. And so when you eat a low fat diet, a diet and you don't really eat much fat, it's just sitting there and then the bile gets really sludgy. So then it's not able to kind of go through and clean up the fat for you or digest the fat for you. And so that adaptation period, it's just the fat is basically just shooting through you. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. So, um, but as you consume natural digestive enzymes, which are basically what your body creates, like the hydrochloric acid, the ox bile, the bile salts, all of those things will just, you know, support your natural body's rhythm of digestion to then be able to digest these foods. So if you get on like hydrochloric acid to increase your stomach acid, to be able to digest and break down foods in general, and then you get on bile salts to break down fats, especially if you don't have a gallbladder, um, all of those things can help your body kind of wake those things areas up. And then over time, you should be able to supplement off that. But, um, over time, but in general, I think that is the biggest thing I've seen to help people, especially with having loose stools. Because the thing is, I think most people feel better on a high fat, lower protein diet or a carnivore where it's like, you know, more ribeye with maybe a little bit of butter on top. But when people start doing that, they start getting the loose stools, right? But then if they eat just too much lean meat, that's when you get like that, like the, I don't know if you guys ever get it, but when you start feeling like you're burning up because you have like the meat sweats, it's normally because you're eating too much protein and not enough fat. And so, but then if you eat too much fat, then you have the runs, right? So it's like, where do I fall? So right. I think the biggest tool to speed up that process is the digestive enzymes. Otherwise, yeah, you're going to have to go lower fat, but then have a little bit harder of a transition to being full carnivore. And because too much protein can make you feel tired. Yeah. So. I feel exhausted if I have too much protein. Yes, I, I do really too. That. Yeah. No, I, there was a few times where I tested after eating a big like meat meal and then I took my glucose and it was diabetic numbers. And it's because my body had to process the steaks that I was eating that were a little bit too lean. And yeah. so, but I think it's all bio individual. Some people do really well eating lean meats and being, and then they get ripped. Right. But then some people do much better on a two to one fat to protein. So I think you should find, basically, I think we're all saying you got to find and figure out what works best for you in terms of fat mm -hmm. protein. And then if you do have the runs, you can either try to wait it out or, you know, cut some of the fat, or you can try to use digestive support too. And I'll list some um, options in the notes later. Um, the next few questions are about gut health. We just talked about a little bit about it. Um, it's a really complicated topic, but um, I guess um, in for you guys, like, have you healed any gut symptoms? Like, so it, this can be either like, um, you know, maybe if you guys had any candida overgrowth or, um, and you know, there's some people actually that when they're going through the adaptation period, they all of a sudden in the middle of the night, they feel super nauseous. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced that. Um, and so there's a lot of people that feel nausea when they're eating a little bit too much fat. Um, 
but um and also if you guys uh have like ever noticed like low stomach acid and one indication of that is constantly burping after your meal like you feel indigestion that's a sign of low stomach acid so have what have your guys's experience been with that digestion process um and then have you guys noticed any healing and then i'm assuming you guys haven't used any supplements but yeah if you could just kind of talk through that go ahead laura <laughs> Um, so I definitely, I think when I transitioned to carnivore, I really hadn't done a lot of research yet and didn't know about this stuff. And so I experienced all these symptoms and it's not until much later looking back on what is gut health, what is candida, what is, um, some of these things that I realized I went through a lot of that. Um, and so I ended up going to my doctor several times with what I now know was some sort of like candida dying off or overgrowth. Um, and they didn't even know what it was at the time and so now when it's been fully passed i look back and say well that's exactly what that was i read about it and learn about it now um also just same thing like you said burping i didn't know that was a symptom of low stomach acid until now but i constantly after every meal even keto meals used to have lots of gas lots of um issues with that and even just like something like super foul breath or you know having burping but it being really foul um and all of that has been completely resolved and they were things that i didn't even you just think are normal at the time yeah yeah it's funny because there's so many symptoms that we feel and we think oh it's old age or you know this and that mm -hmm. but it's actually like if you have optimal health you should have no symptoms in your body so no joint pain no back pain no digestive issues right. no burping no gas like that is all that something is not right and it's yeah it's, so go ahead i think a, a year ago if you would have said like did you have any gut issues uh, i would have said of course not no i'm fine but now looking back the digestive issues and the gut issues are two of the biggest things that have healed for me um that are a little less visual than like a weight loss perspective Absolutely. Yeah, I had I just had a lot of relief switching over. You know, I, I know I had some candida die off. Absolutely. I know we're going to talk about oxalate dumping um, next. I definitely had some oxalate dumping. Now, looking back that that scared the crap out of me because mm -hmm. um, I was like, what is this? You know, um, and I felt very just like really exhausted. Um, you know, after I would eat, I would just feel really, really tired. And that could be that I kind of would need to like eat a little bit less. I'm just somebody who does better to eat smaller portions. Even if I tweak the fat and protein ratios, I just, my body just digests the food a lot better. Um, so yeah, I, I think I've definitely had gut healing. I've had a lot of candida that's gone. I used to have eczema and I know eczema is a sign of, you know, poor gut health. Yes. Um, I was not able to wear my wedding ring for like five years because every time I put it on, I would break out. Um, but after I would say like probably three months of carnivore, I was able to wear my wedding ring again. So, um, yeah, I know that that has to do with gut health and also the, another weird thing, and I know this is also gut health is that I don't have to wear deodorant at all. I don't know if yeah. you guys have ever had, <laughs> it's very bizarre. Um, but if I kind of go off and eat something like I had tacos with my husband a couple months ago and the next day I was in the sauna and I was like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no there there's a lot of things like that but yeah that makes sense i mean um there's a lot of carnivores that don't ever wash their hair because yeah, it I'll never really once a month yeah it doesn't really get oily or um you know there's a lot it just your body naturally just balances out and uh, there's a lot of people that don't brush their teeth because i mean you know they may just brush it with water but not use any yeah. toothpaste because you probably will never get cavities if you only eat meat, I mean, obviously floss out the meat, but um, in general, it's just uh, they never had dentists long ago, right? Like even a right. hundred years ago. So where were all the cavities, right? So it's it's just interesting. Um, yeah, I noticed all the plaque kind of fell off of my teeth in like the first six weeks of carnivore. It was very strange because I have pretty crooked teeth on the bottom. I still haven't fixed that. <laughs> I don't know if I ever will, but I tend to get a lot of plaque down there um, and it kind of just went away with carnivore. So that was very interesting. Yeah, the next time you go to your dentist or your um, eye doctor, ask them about how bad sugar is and they can tell you how specifically, you know, detrimental those sugar components are for their their field of interest. 
So it's pretty interesting. Uh, why don't we move over to the oxalate dumping? So what what is your experience been, Sarah, with oxalate dumping? If if and what what were kind of like your symptoms and signs, and then how did you kind of get past that? I had a lot of rashes, just different places, like on my chest, on my arms, and I it really scared me. Um, I had like actually the kind of like sand that you get in your eyes when you wake up every morning. It was almost just like coming out of my eyes constantly because I was a big spinach smoothie person. I would just overdo the oxalates constantly, always munching on almonds as like a healthy snack. Um, I had a lot of pain in my joints that actually got worse before it completely went away. Um, and the way I managed it was um, my doctor gave me a binder um, that I bought from her full script. So, and that helped quite a bit was just taking that binder and um, just kind of weathering the storm, going in the sauna quite a bit as well and drinking a good amount of water. That's good. What about, uh, what about for you, Laura? I don't think that was something that was a big part of it for me. Um, I had, you know, some, I, even looking at specific symptoms that I can relate to that, I had spent my years of doing vegan and the smoothies and stuff years before and really in the last two years i had been pretty eating pretty terrible diet in general with not even a lot of the healthy foods the healthy foods mixed in yeah. um, and so i don't really think those were i'm sure there was a lot more gradual of that release over the last several years into uh, more of a processed food <laughs> problem there's not even a, even a processed food doesn't have a lot of oxygen <laughs> that's, that's true i know so it's so ironic just, but yeah. yeah, in pizza and ice cream, there's not as much uh, oxalates. <laughs> so I think that was something more years past when I was vegan for a, a time um, okay. and then had transitioned back to eating meat. I'm sure it was much more gradual, something I dealt with back then. Yeah. I, I think now if I were to have something, though, that was non-carnivore, like a salad or something, I definitely get pretty itchy all over my body. My skin will get really dry. Um and I can tell a difference now if I were to eat something that were to have an, you know, oxalates in it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think um, I had similar symptoms myself as Sarah. So um, I lived off spinach salads for like 12 years and I would just add a little bit of tuna here and there, but it was primarily like spinach, almonds, you know, all the things that are very, very rich in oxalates. And so even now, still, once in a while, I'll, I'll get like, a, like you're talking about that sand in your eye. So I feel like there's this mucus that I can never remove in my eye. But I know, so I know that Sally Norton, she recommends, you know, slowly transition off um, oxalates and then maybe just, um, you know, weaning yourself off, don't really fast. But I know many people too, though, that have not done it that way, where they just stuck to carnivore and they kind of like went through the pain of the oxalate dumping and then they heal. So I'm sort of in that boat. I think if it's really extreme where you have the skin boils and you see like you can actually see the crystals, then maybe, you know, work with Sally and see like what your next steps can be. But I think removing, you know, the spinach and then just focusing on healing, using bone broth, fasting and all that stuff. I think over time it'll go away. So yeah. I know for me before, like I had the eczema and I had like random rashes come up um, and I had, you know, a lot more mucus in my eye, but I don't, I almost never get it. And I didn't slowly wean it off it, but mm -hmm. it's a transition. And I mean, I really ate so much spinach. Like I think I ate a pound of spinach every day. I was um, <laughs> Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. And, uh, almonds, I mean, almonds were my favorite nuts and on keto, like I did everything almonds, right. Almond flour, almonds, like, yeah. so yes. And then like the dark chocolate and all that stuff. Yeah. So I think you can transition off and especially if you weren't like vegetarian or vegan, it's probably even easier because you probably weren't mm -hmm. consuming as many oxalates. So I don't think people should worry too much. I think carnivore can heal most of it, but if you have severe, severe, reactions and sensitivities, then I'd work with somebody like Sally and see what, you know, the next steps are. Um, one question before we move off gut healing. So someone asked about homemade raw milk. So I am very pro raw milk because all the, I mean, all the nutrients are natural. It's like you're getting what God, um, God and nature intended. And so when you drink any kind of processed milk, whether it's A2, uh, organic, grass fed, but if they're pasteurized, homogenized, all of the nutrients are stripped and then added back in or majority of them. So 
I think raw milk is best, but in terms of kefir to sort of heal your gut, it's, there's like two boats. So some people are like, oh, it's like the prebiotics that will feed your body's probiotics and you'll become even healthier. It's good for your gut. But there are people that have candida. And I know some from my clients specifically that even those prebiotics will like the candida will love and feed off of it. So I am more in the boat of anything that's fermented and raw when your gut is healing, do not take it. So that's where I stand. Not everyone stands with me. So, I mean, I had a conversation with ancestral health guy and he doesn't agree with me, but you know, so it's, it's all bio individual. And so that's my short answer with uh, raw milk kefir. It's good for overall gut health, but if you have any like dysbiosis, um, you know, some candida overgrowth, I would stay away, but I mean, that's kind of like a generalization. Okay. Mm-hmm. So move, go ahead. Were you going to say something? I was just going to say before I went carnivore, I was doing a lot of like, you know, the, I'd go to the health food store and there was a woman that made her own sauerkraut that was supposed yes. to be good. And I would buy that. I would buy the kombucha and that stuff would hurt my, like I would feel pregnant. I would get so bloated. It would hurt my body so much. And everyone kept saying, oh, it's going to help you heal your gut. And it was just absolutely the complete opposite for me. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes. Add that in. (laughs) Yeah, no, I, and I agree. So I, I mean, I, I don't tell my anecdotal story as much, but so, you know, I mean, I'm Korean American, so we always have kimchi. My husband loves it. I'm not a big fan, but he's always like, are you sure you're going to just eat meat for the rest of your life? And so once in a while, he'll be like, please, can you at least eat some kimchi or like the juice? You're not eating the vegetable. So there was one or two times that I had it. And then immediately my stomach hurt the mm-hmm. blow. And I'm like, no, I'm done. I'm done with this fermentation. I don't need it. I thrive with meat. I don't need it. So, but I mean, there are people, I mean, if, you know, there are people that do okay with it. So, I, you know, I think it depends. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on. Um, There is a question about skin breakouts going from keto to carnivore. I think we kind of touched on this with the gut Mm -hmm. health. Did you guys have any, um, you know, like apparent gut, you know, anything that we haven't touched in terms of skin breakouts? No? Okay. All right. So I think some of it could just be the transition. Some of it could just be gut healing. So a lot of these questions, guys, it's really about like just have the patience you know, we ate 30, 40, 50 years of, you know, processed foods, it takes time for our bodies to transition to just meat. And 14 days a month is honestly not that much time. And so you just need to give it more time. Okay, so let's move on. Um, There's a question about supplements. Uh, Do you guys take supplements? And then what do you guys kind of take? I have not this entire journey. Oh, I know that um, really nothing at all until very recently. I just started taking like a D3 supplement um, and a krill oil. And I don't even know if those are necessary, but uh, uh, it's literally just started within the last couple weeks. Um, but other than that, I have not taken anything this whole time. And I know I did get some vitamin D blood work done. And this one snapshot did uh, say it was my vitamin D3 was low. So that's part of the reason why I incorporated that. I also have been working on being outside at particular times of the day, but in Arizona, it's not as difficult. However, uh, I mean, I work at an office during the day, so it's not possible for me to get outside as much um, in those prime times, especially with like exposed areas. Yes. Um, Yes. So I started taking the the D3 supplement and the krill oil. Okay. Have you noticed a difference at all? No. <laughs> Which is part of the reason why I never really took them in the first place. Sure. I guess I'm curious to see if the if the numbers will change. Um, and I'm hoping that over time, the one thing that I think could help that I noticed from a symptom of low vitamin D is that your sleep is not as good or you have a hard time staying asleep in the night. And so I'm hoping that maybe this will help. Uh, with that because I definitely have problems like staying asleep throughout the whole night. So I am curious if that will improve uh, over time if I'm getting more vitamin D. Uh, Before we move on to Sarah, one thing I'll say is so I, okay, so I'm just going to throw a wrench in there. So I went to Mexico and I was in the sun. I got almost sunburned and I rarely get sunburned because I'm pretty all like olive skin. And I got my blood work done a week later and my D was low. So, I mean, granted, maybe it was even yeah. lower than that, but, but it was low and um, the doctor immediately recommended me taking vitamin D, but, um, I, and I haven't. And so I think the logic is, yes, if you take supplements, you'll have it in your blood. That doesn't mean that you're necessarily absorbing it, but right. maybe we don't 
I mean, you know, maybe we don't need as much vitamin D as the nutritional guidelines give, because again, it may yeah. just be right. The standard American diets. So I would also recommend just consuming food. So vitamin D works with the other fat soluble vitamins. So it also works to consume calcium with it. And also vitamin K if your mm -hmm. stomach, for example, has low stomach acid, it's harder to absorb calcium. And then if you don't absorb calcium, you have less vitamin D, you know, so there's all these like, levers that need to kind of yeah. work together. So I always say that's why if you just incorporate like one vitamin D, then how are the other things kind of playing together? But um, so with all that said, <laughs> no, that's perfect. And that's why we, I haven't taken anything, you know, it's I've been carnivore for almost 18 months. And it's really having yeah. to just kind of said, I'm going to let just see what happens with the food, eat, eating only muscle meat, see how things level out over time. And so it's one of those things that I'm reluctantly doing and, and don't even know like you probably just convinced me to stop taking it anyway. <laughs> no, sorry. I'm not that sold. I'm not that sold. Well, so like, but make sure to just incorporate, if you're going to take the vitamin D, so the best way to have it get absorbed is to have K2 with it. So make sure to eat foods that have K2, which is basically like your eggs, your dark chicken. And I had a list. I'll put it in the show notes, but, you know, and they normally come with D too, because I think the nature always tries to balance. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, and I'll send you this article and I'll put it in the show notes. There's like this article about, you know, if you just supplement like one nutrient, like what does it do for the rest of your body? Right. So like yeah. the perfect example is most people are deficient in calcium. So a lot of people consume calcium, but it's normally not the calcium that's you're deficient. And it's all the other things that are not working. That's making your calcium not get absorbed. Right. So, um, in terms of your night thing, it might be the adrenals. So, you know, like yeah. just over time balancing it, lowering your stress, and then the sugar levels will help because normally that's the number one thing that will have people wake up in the middle of the night. It's like you have an up kick in cortisol, epinephrine, adrenaline that like raises your blood sugar and then your body's like, oh my gosh, I gotta go run away from a tiger. And that's why you'll probably run uh, wake up. So yeah. that could be it too. So Okay. Yeah, maybe try some meditation right before you go to bed. That might help. I know, I get too much <laughs> like, okay, now it's like, Go, 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 and time to go to sleep. So I need to start like winding down. Winding down, yeah. Yeah, you got to yeah. do your like kids' nap time. I mean, your bedtime routine. You just got to follow. I know. You. I have to stop texting you guys right before I go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Blame us. <laughs> just uh, so, what about you, Sarah? I've kind of played around with supplementation over the last year. Um, since I've been trying to cut down on my coffee, which I tried to just go off of it, and I had. Uh, not a good, not oh, a good experience with just cutting down my coffee. I have added in, um, I've actually added a little extra magnesium glycinate in the morning and the evening. Um, I also am taking L-theanine just for a neurotransmitter boost. Um, we do the in, I guess, olive oil or it's some kind of no, coconut oil. No, it's no, it's olive oil. D three K two supplements. It's normally olive oil. Sometimes they use MCT oil. Yeah, I think our K2 has MCT. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. My daughter, too. Um, I was doing the ancestral supplements, but I've just been trying to add a little bit more liver into my diet. That's good. And I do a um, like a transdermal gel that Dr. Rimka has recommended to me. It's kind of like a glandular oh, okay. Um, okay. to help support my adrenals, just because I do have a lot of stress in my life. Um, yeah. And I, I did try to take berberine over the summer, and I had a horrible experience with that. It made me really, really nauseous mm -hmm. um, for like two weeks, even after I took it. It was, it was bad. So I think we have to be super careful on carnivore with just like, oh, here's a podcast that talks about this supplement and how great it is for you. I think it's important to like have somebody that you're working with. Maybe someone will work with you, Judy, or someone's, you know, got a doctor, somebody they work with before they just, because the berberine was like, I heard on a podcast. I'm like, yeah. oh, this will lower my blood sugar. Awesome. Um, and it ended up making me really, really sick for a couple of weeks. Yeah. I, I always say that I, I know our, so I know our soil isn't as great as, you know, many, many years ago, but the thing is, I don't, even if it's not as much, right. So we don't have as many nutrients in our cows and our plants and all that stuff. Our generations ago, they still did not eat like tons of supplements, right. They only ate like from one animal. So I think we should kind of go back, let our bodies adjust. 
-hmm. And then we figure out, right, like where, where we may really need support, not just throw in, oh, you were low in vitamin K, vitamin, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then we just throw in all these supplements to fix that, but because that's not getting to the root cause. And I think getting to the root cause is always beneficial because your body wants to be in this balance. And so if there's something off, that doesn't mean you're deficient in that one supplement or one nutrient. There might be something else that's causing that to be, you know, right. reduced. So it's um, the one best example I always give is uh, with phosphorus and calcium. So, I mean, people like always, if you drink a lot of soda, right, like a lot of diet soda, a lot of a Coke, the phosphorus causes your calcium to be leached out of your bones. And so when people get their blood work done, they're like, oh, I'm fine in calcium. But yes, mm. because if your calcium in your blood is not balanced, you, you can die. So your bones will keep giving calcium to balance the blood, but eventually you may have osteoporosis and your bones will not show that you're in that level of, you know, mm. osteoporosis until it's almost too late. So, you know, people might think, oh, you know, and even if they have low calcium in the blood, they may just take, you know, calcium supplements, but it might be that you're just eating too much phosphorus, right? So again, it's a, uh, it's the balance, so. Yeah, I think what you guys said is right, you know, with um, just being smart about what you supplement and sort of trying to figure out what's, you know, best for you guys. Okay. One thing at a time, like never <laughs> grab a bunch of stuff and try to supplement because you want to make sure that, you know, if you're having side effects, you know exactly what, you know, where it's coming from, I think. Yeah, I always say just take a step back, right? So when we're eating the standard American diet, most people just took maybe a probiotic and maybe yeah. a like a general supplement, right? Like a general vitamin centrum, that type of thing. So why is it all of a sudden we try to eat cleaner, but then we have to eat like super clean, right? Like we need to get every single nutrient we need to, you know, it's, it's just, it's balanced guys. Like, you know, yeah. just, if you want to eat muscle meat, that's why I'm like, I'd rather eat muscle meat than go back and say, forget it. This thing is impossible. I can't eat right. liver. I can't eat this and that. So I'm going back to McDonald's, right? Like let's just eat meat. Like I, I let's, we'll fix all the hairy areas after we get adapted and heal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Off my soapbox. Let's move on. <laughs> all right. So, um, how much salt do you guys take? Do you guys measure it? Do you guys just consume it? I salt things, my food pretty heavily. I think I the very beginning when I was transitioning or fasting, I would add salt to my water, like a quarter teaspoon for a maybe 24 ounce, um, water bottle. But I quit doing that within a couple of months. It was a good transition for me with headaches and kind of getting adapted and getting through the initial carb withdrawals. But in the last year, I have not just taken salt. Um, it's more been just even on longer fasts. I haven't really needed to supplement salt at all. I just put a lot on my food, um, that's good. but that's it. Yeah, I think it's another balanced thing. So I was the same as you. Like I, I salted a lot in the beginning and now I don't really need to. Yeah extra yeah i'm the what, same way exactly okay. like I, I just salt to taste and i don't really add it to water or anything like that i don't feel like yeah. i really need it yeah no i i'm yeah <laughs> okay but i think in the beginning in the very beginning if you're trying to fast or and you're having headaches or you're not feeling great and you're at low lack of energy that's a great time to add salt oh but yeah over over time you know your body the longer we've all been doing this the less you need it yeah yeah i completely agree i think when you're first um, transitioning, you should actually salt before you feel the headaches because sometimes, especially if you're extended fasting, um, if you're already feeling the headaches, you feel that fatigue, the muscle aches, and then you keep adding salt, it's sometimes it's you, you've gone too far that you just right. got to your fast. It's um, there's no kind of turning back. So I, I always suggest if you're new to fasting and you're going to extend it fast, you should start the salt before you even feel the headaches. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, prep your body for that. Okay, so there is about food fatigue. Um, have you guys experienced when you guys first transitioned to carnivore, did you guys get like sick of meat? And then if you did, um, like, what do you guys do? I don't, I mean, I could eat grilled ribeyes every day and I would never get sick of that. When I do get sick of things is when I can't get to fresh grilled ribeyes, like when I'm trying to bring leftovers to work and stuff. But any type of fatigue for me just can be fixed by having fresh grilled ribeyes. Um, I think I just try to suggest people to use eggs to supplement or other meats and take a break. I'm a big 
I think to me, a, a cast iron steak versus a grill steak versus a, you know, air fryer steak tastes very different. Um, I'm not afraid of a little bit of spices either. And so salt only versus spices is a nice change. Even maybe taking a little bit of cheese crumb, like feta cheese or blue cheese crumbles and putting that on a steak. So I think there's a lot of very slight variations that you can make that keep you eating steak every day or meat every day. Um, just little things like different cuts and different cooking methods change everything about the, the taste. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I totally agree with that. I absolutely love, now I'm a cast iron ribeye kind of gal. I love <laughs> ribeye in a cast iron and that's my go-to. I could just eat that every single day. I never get tired of it. If I feel like I want a little variety, I do add a little, you know, some eggs in there, some bacon. I have to be careful with the dairy because I, I always want to overeat it. Um, it's really delicious and then it kind of makes me bloated, but um I, I haven't really had a big issue with getting tired of what I'm eating. You know, I've been, I guess I'm lucky with that. And there's so much you could eat. You know, I've tried oysters and salmon and you can do chicken. You can do all kinds of stuff. But honestly, every time I make something, like I made um, chicken wings a week ago and I was like, oh, I want a ribeye. So like anytime I'm not having a ribeye, it's kind of just like what I want. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I have a I think I'm similar to you guys too. I think in the beginning when I first transitioned, I had like chicken wings and ribs and, you know, steaks and ground beef. And then I would make like these concoctions and like the egg loaf and all that. But over time, I just noticed, yeah, I could, my, my husband's like, do you really not get sick of your ribeyes? Or I don't post pictures because I just feel like I'm eating the same thing. It's like I'm almost taking the same picture, right? So, yeah. but yeah, I think over time you just, you eat when you are hungry and then when you eat it just every single time it just does not fail you it just tastes that good right so, yeah yeah i think maybe in the beginning you know find get creative get dishes you know use different methods to cook foods but i think over time you, you start getting very basic like i hate cooking i just like to cook steak and it's so simple right so yeah uh, okay so there's a few questions about cheating in general so for you guys so we can close off with this, but um, in general for you guys, when you kind of fall off or, you know, you eat a little bit too many processed meats or like sausage sticks, um, like jerkies and then like pork rinds and then like with cream cheese or if you even eat like a Quest bar or like the diet sodas, how do you guys kind of reel it back and then get back to feeling better? For me, um, I have to be really careful because I don't want to go into eating disorder behavior because of course, like, you know, for me, and this is just me from my history with eating disorders, like I could do a fast and I would feel better like really quickly. Um, but mentally that kind of puts me in a, and sets me up to be in a binge cycle, you know, like, oh, I just did a 24 hour fast. I feel so much better, you know, and then you, then the little sugar craving kind of sneaks back in. So um, my best bet, and that's why I was just so grateful that we had this challenge is just keep it simple. Eat the meal that you really love, you know, eat that rib. For me, it's like ribeye in a cast iron with a couple eggs. You know, I might fast a little bit longer just because I'm literally not hungry because I ate foods that, you know, were not carnivore. So I may not be as hungry, but I try not to do like any, any extended fasting, anything like that to make up for it. And I just kind of get back on the beam, have a ribeye, have some eggs and just try to take it one day at a time. And don't, when, no matter what, don't eat that bench food, don't eat the sugar, don't just don't do it. Um, so this carnivore 75 heart has been amazing for me because I was really, really, really struggling with that. Like I said, after just going on vacation for a few days, having a few non-carnivore foods, and here I was a month after vacation still doing, still slipping into that behavior. You know, I'd have a couple of good days and then, oh, I can have this, you know, quick bar or whatever. So, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. Uh, so what about you, Laura? I think for me, the, it's, it is a little different where I do so well with just setting pretty strict, like putting restrictions on myself um, and saying, you know, like just making sure I'm only eating that one meal a day helps me to kind of reel things back in. 
Also, I know that if people are having like sweet cravings, I get some really good coarse crunchy salt and I don't need the salt necessarily for the for the electrolytes like we talked about, but it does help me to feel like I'm chewing something to eat something. It almost like satisfies that um, sensation without being sweet. Um, I know people who, you know, will have a piece of sugar free gum or something, but to me, that's maybe a bridge that helps you to break through things in the very beginning, but I think long term, it's only continuing those triggers of needing something sweet after your meal. So yeah. I try to limit it. Yeah, I I don't do that. I don't do that, but I use something like a coarse salt if I really needed it, or I'm sitting on the couch on a Friday night and I've had a really stressful day, week at work. Those are when the emotional cravings come in for me. And so, you know, changing up my routine, talking to texting a friend, talking to my husband, or crunch, at worst case, I'll end up crunching on some salt, uh, really helps me to kind of push through that. And then celebrating the times that you don't have something, um, trying to reset immediately, just if one bite of something in the morning, if you know, it was Halloween week, if you had one piece of Halloween candy on Tuesday, it doesn't mean you have to like, continue eating bad all day and all week. So trying to stop as as quick as possible and for me this breaking the cycle of saying i'm gonna wait until monday really helped me to start writing things in a lot quicker and a lot um a lot easier and then the longer you do you go without any cheats the easier it is I, i'm not somebody who could handle like a once a month or once a week cheat meal um and be able to stay on track so the longer that i'm strict which is that's why i don't do any cheat meals and why i can't you know, do that at all. So it just helps me to, to stay strict the longer I am strict, I guess. Yeah, I think all of those are really good points. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I do see a lot of people and I think it's just our natural personalities. But, you know, when people mess up, kind of mess up or have that cheat meal, they think, okay, so tomorrow I'm going all in, I am going to fast for hours, I'm going to eat like super yes. clean. And it's like, that is not the approach you should take. Because that will, it just makes it that much harder. And then you will have a higher chance of having a slip up. Yeah. So it's better to just, if you had a binge and a purge or you had sweets, it's better to just eat a lot of meat the next day. So every time you have a craving, just eat more meat. Every time yeah. you want something else, just eat more meat. Even if that day you may gain a little weight, it's fine. Like heal and yeah. get past the cravings and you're fine. I'll share a little bit about gum. So I had that, right? So after every meal, I wanted to gum. So there was this crazy period where I literally would just chew, 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 spit, chew, 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 spit. And I think I had like two packs of gum and they're all sugar free. I checked my sugar a lot, a, like an hour later and I was in pre-diabetic numbers. Wow. So, I mean, I know people are like gum is safe, but I don't think it is. Especially right. like, mo yeah, that like one week I was doing that, I noticed. And then I noticed when I stopped the gum, my energy kind of like, I kind of went through a very small keto food yeah. for like one or two days. It's, it's insane. But I mean, if you look at the sugars that are in gums, it's like maltitol. It's like the high glycemic sugars that are crappy. So yeah, I think gum is not an option. And also like when you're chewing, your body thinks it's digesting food. So it's like constantly right. having that digestion go. So, I mean, if anything, maybe chew ice. I don't even know if that's a great option. But the other thing is if you have cravings, sometimes like wrapping up a deli meat with a stick of butter. And, and I know this is so counterintuitive, but sometimes that helps. Like just having a good enough amount of fat will also help with the cravings. Yeah. And All that's right. what I, tr oh, I just try to say too. Like if you're going to cave and eat and you feel like I have to have something sweet, so eat some bacon and eggs. And then I guarantee yeah. you like that's going to help things um, move along. But like you said, worst case scenario, you eat extra meat that day that, or eat yeah. extra fat that you weren't planning on it. At least it's going to help you bridge through and, um, move past all that. So. Anyway. Yeah. And also, um, I just thought of it, but also sometimes sparkling water with a little bit of like the natural flavors or, you know, like a little bit of lemon, like that helps with that fizz. It's a little different, you know, so mm -hmm. there's always options. Just the sugar option should never be the option because right. it will, that one little bite will never be satiating enough. Like it'll it's never like be. The alarm goes off in my brain and it's yeah, like, yeah, have have more. It's not, it, it's like one piece of candy is just not going to be enough for me. Like I need to know that there's like a bag waiting for me. So it's like what, having one piece of candy is not even appealing, even though my brain might try to trick me into it to get me to walk down that sugar craving right. path. You know, yeah, that's I'm not exactly. reality, whatever happens for me. 
Yeah, I always think, oh, you know, I've been so good. Just sugar-free, this won't be bad. And then it's like one more, and I keep seeing myself go back to the kitchen. So I totally get it. Yep. All right, so last question for you guys. Um, how do you guys plan on navigating Thanksgiving and Christmas? So last Thanksgiving and Christmas was our first like holiday season of carnivore. And I'm you know pretty sure we're going to handle things. We've talked about it. We're going to handle things the same way. Um, we tried to really break up traditions. Our family is small and we have a, a little family here. We don't have a lot of extended family here. And so for Thanksgiving, we just didn't want to cook a whole meal for us and when nobody's going to eat it. So we decided to go out and it's very anti-traditional, but we went out to a Brazilian steakhouse and got reservations and had a fancy expensive meal out and we probably spent less though on eating out as a family than we would have if we had bought all the Thanksgiving groceries in the first place. Um, so that's for us personally. And then Christmas last year, we kind of splurged and bought some giant tomahawk steaks and some of those big giant crab legs from Costco. And so oh, that's awesome. we really just stuck to like expensive meat. So it, we're, you know, rather than all of the fixings for a Christmas dinner, we just kind of took all that money and bought kind of splurged on some expensive meat. So it still felt like a holiday, but we didn't have to be around that. Um, I guess the, my biggest suggestion for somebody, if you're going to one of those uh, events for your family and you don't have control over what the menu is going to be, just eat before you go so that you're full and then pick on things that you can have a little turkey, have a little ham if you can, but maybe eat a good steak before you go to Christmas dinner and then have some of, you know, Aunt Karen's uh, deli tray and skip the lasagna, I guess. That's good. Yeah, um, for us, you know, we've got my sisters and my mom. We have a lot of family here, so we'll definitely, we won't be at our house. We're going to be going to other people's houses for the meal. Um, so for me, my plan is to, I'm going to cook a turkey. I'll bring it. Um, and then I'm just going to bring some stuff that I like. I might make some halloumi cheese or, you know, just some stuff that I don't eat every single day. Like I don't normally, like I said, I don't normally eat dairy. Um, but on the holidays, I may let myself have just a little bit of that. Um, and I love Laura's suggestion about getting like the little more expensive meats. Like we just found a butcher not too far from here that's got some tomahawk steaks. So we may do that. Um, but just for me, it's going to be a lot of a mental game. You know, I think the holidays are an emotional time of year for a lot of people. Um, so having support system, I just love that we're, we're doing this 75 hard thing. I'll probably be in the Facebook group a little bit more or on my Instagram a little bit more, just kind of like checking in saying like, what's Judy eating? What are they doing? You know, like, that kind of stuff, it really helps me, the um, mirror neurons. I don't know if you've kind of studied yeah. that, but just, you know, looking at what other people that, like, Laura's doing, um, that always helps me. I, I'm always watching Laura's stories and keeping up with her. I feel like, you know, we're friends, but I'm always like, oh, what's Laura doing today? Because it's so important for me to have that other person that I respect and that I, I you know, I really like and see, okay, she's really living this lifestyle in a healthy way. And... Um, having a big community around us, I think that's really what's going to kind of carry me through uh, the holidays for sure. Yeah, I think I think that's the whole beauty of, you know, this Carnivore 75 Hard Challenge. It's, I mean, no matter what you're going through, you can use the hashtag, you can use the hashtag, sorry, it's time to go pick up my son, but um, it's, you know, you can use the community hashtag or you can go on Facebook private group and, you know, you see that the way you're eating, the way you're living, it's totally fine. I mean, did you guys see there was a post of this woman, she didn't get the bracelet, but she decided to dye her hair blue. And, you know, for all of us, we understand, right? So like, that's the beauty of it, right? So yeah, I think, I think it's great, um, Laura, you know, for you to get fancier meats, it, it makes the day still really special. And I mean, you know, the, I think the whole beauty of it all will be that we'll be able to be present and we'll be able to not be like, oh, I just want one more chocolate, but how many people saw me eat already so many like, pieces and, you know, like focused on food and not enjoying people's company. Mm -hmm. um, I know for me, a lot of times I will eat prior because I always go to um, events that are standard American diet foods. And mm -hmm. so then I'll just hold a sparkling water. And so then people just assume I already ate or, you know, I'll just like nibble on cheese or deli meats. But you know, in general, like it's always, and if you're always talking, it's like people don't question, like, why aren't you eating? Right. Right. So. right. Yeah. I went to a meditation retreat at my teacher's house this weekend and they made like kitchery, which is 
mung bean oh. soup and rice and all this stuff. And I, it was like a non-issue because I just sipped on my warm water and just socialized with everyone. Yeah. But if I go and I make a big deal and be like, oh, I can't eat that. I can't have that. And I make a spectacle of myself. It's, it's not comfortable for anybody. And for me, it just, it, it's not productive. So in yeah. situations like that, it's like I had my carnivore snacks in the car and I could just have some warm water and just enjoy spending time with people. And I think that's, you know, Laura's mentioned it so many times, like we have to learn as, you know, carnivores or just people who are trying to overcome food addiction, that holidays, birthdays, all that stuff is about connecting with your family and your friends and your loved ones and creating memories and not about stuffing your face with food and, you know, what I get to eat. You know, yeah. we, we have to reframe that. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think. There's more to holidays than just foods that make you feel bad after. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, thank you guys so much for coming on. Sorry about the technical difficulties in the beginning, but um, I will try to get this released soon. So thank you guys, and I will um, – oh, why don't you guys um, tell people where people can find you real quick? Hi, Laura. <laughs> uh, right here on YouTube, you can just search for my name, Laura Spath, on YouTube, and then Laura E. Spath on Instagram. And for me, it's uh, at carnivore.yogi on Instagram, and my YouTube channel is Carnivore Yogi. Okay, and I'll put everything in the show notes too. So thank you guys again. This was helpful, Thanks. and I hope um, everyone, you know, got a lot of their questions answered and that it was helpful for them. All right, so I will talk to you guys later. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.